Good afternoon, Nerd Fam, and welcome back to sunny San Francisco. We're here at Databricks Data and AI Summit. My name is Savannah Peterson for theCUBE, and I am particularly excited about our next guest because when I'm not reading about AI or sitting in front of this wonderful camera, thanks to the team at theCUBE, I am reading a Condé Nast publication, whether that be GQ, Vogue, Traveler, you name it, I'm a fan. And we've got Tim from Condé Nast with us right now on the show. Tim, thank you so much for coming to hang out. Thank you for having me. Me. They actually let me have this segment because I'm such a fan. Oh, that's great. <laughs> I know. I, I feel I feel really lucky, and I'm and I'm super curious. I'm sure everyone's familiar with Condé Nast, so we don't need you to talk about the company at all. But I really want to know what data is most important to the company. You've got so many different properties, so many different touch points, subscribers, online viewers. Break it down. What's your job like? So we think about really two kinds of data. There are two pieces that are essential to everything that we do. There's data on our users and data on our content. And from that, we can build everything else. So if we know, if we have a good way to understand our content, and we have a good way to understand how our users interact with that content, then we can start to build more models that draw more engagement, that can get as much value as we can out of our, um, out of our properties and our, ti our time with our customers. How many touch points do you have, say, on, on your reader's side? But how many different vectors are you looking at to make someone's profile, so to speak? Yeah, there's quite a bit. I mean, there's a lot of how frequently they interact with our content. We have um, what type of content they interact with. We, to some extent, know how many different brands people interact with. Oh, um, and then there's the usual, like, what devices are they on? Where are they in the country? Is there anything that's really surprised you since working for Condé Nast about some of the readers and the patterns they have? I'm sure there is. Let me think for a second. Oh, take um, your time. <laughs> Seriously. So, I think where what I've maybe struck by is like how loyal New Yorker readers are. Um, oh, I like that. Yeah. Okay, that's good. Like New Yorker content's pretty engaging, and it is. Not for everybody, but it is like something that demands a lot of time. It is, yeah. And uh, and I, I think what we what I was shocked by was like how loyal those subscribers are. How how um, once they commit to the New Yorker, like how nothing changes that commitment to the New Yorker. I'm curious because I feel like, I feel like loyalty is very much a New Yorker trait. I'm a former New Yorker myself. Do you think it's because New Yorkers are loyal, that they're loyal to the New Yorkers? Oh, not so many of our New Yorkers. No. I mean, not all of our New Yorker subscribers are in New York. Is right, that. right, okay. <laughs> so it's, it's, it's that demographic, it's that long form, very well written research type writing. Yeah, and I think it's, a, it's almost like the variety of the content, but just like the, the depth of the style. It is, yeah. yeah. Yeah, oh, that's super fascinating. I, I love that. I like that as a little nugget, a little nugget in my pocket. What's uh, what's your favorite Condé Nast property? The one I probably go to most often is New Yorker. Yeah. Um, but I re I go to Bon Appetit quite a bit myself. Oh yeah, I can get down. God, I forget you own some. How many different magazines is it? Fifty. Uh, in all our brands and markets, uh, we're about sixty. It's about sixty. Jeez, yeah. that's a lot. We're all we're all reading it. Okay, so we're here at Databricks. Sorry, I just had to geek out on some Condé stuff there to, to start off with. How do you use Databricks at Condé Nast? We use it for a lot of things. Uh, so I lead the data science and machine learning engineering teams mm -hmm. here. Um, so we use Databricks. Our data engineering team is processing all our data and storing it within Databricks, making it accessible for us. My team uses it for model development. Um, we do a lot of model exploration. We use a lot of the ML tools that they built in. Um, and then we, my machine learning engineering team uses it now to like take those models, turn them into services. We use um, feature stores. We use uh, model serving endpoints. We use feature serving endpoints. We are uh, big into ML flow. We use it quite a bit. Wow, so pretty robust across the board. Do you use it for a lot of different use cases? As, yeah. Yeah, so we build models really in a few use cases. The first is really around 
segmentation. Mm -hmm. um, so some of that is segmentation for advertisement. Some of that is segmentation on like how our users consume content. Um, we also do our do work for uh, for our, our subscription business where we are understanding propensities and uh, people's propensity to subscribe, people's propensity to churn, and then what their like price tolerances uh, essentially yeah. for for renewals. And then the last kind of more broad area is really around user engagement. So we do things like content recommendation models. Um, we do that personalized content recommendation models and more generic content recommendation models. We also think about content discovery. So we've been getting into search um, both on articles and within images. Oh, I bet that could get really interesting, especially across property too. Yeah, so where we have um, a good image use case is in, within the Vogue Runway app. Um, so in the Vogue Runway app, what we have are about 1.2 million runway images that um, were from different runway shows, not necessarily labeled and not necessarily searchable for our end users. So my team kind of went, built uh, from, from, um, from ide ideation to like finished product a tool that could take in text and search the images. And it's been a really, it's a really fun, cool tool. That is a really fun, cool tool, because I'm sure, you know, I, I as a user, when you see something in the magazine or on an app, and you're like, ooh, I want that, or I want something like that, or something more from that designer, or what else, what else is in that collection? It's, it's, a, it's a really fun way to, yeah, to deepen that engagement. I bet it's really sticky. It is sticky. I will be seeing, um, like, now most of our sessions on um, on that runway app include a search. Oh, nice, cool. That's got to be kind of validating when you help yeah. implement that. Yeah. It makes you feel like you're really reading the data, right? Yeah. Must be a scientist or something. In my <laughs> former life. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, why did you choose Databricks to do all this for you? Yeah. So we've been using Databricks since before I came to Condé Nast. So it was a nice structure um, that we had built into place. But I've used it in a number of places. It just a, started for me as a as a data scientist, a tool that we could easily use to collaborate mm -hmm. and um, like building off of Spark, being able to like process massive amounts of data or build models on top of massive amounts of data was really useful. And then they've just continued to build features that make it easier for us as data scientists and machine learning engineers to put models into production. It's nice to be able to carry over that toolkit. How long have you been at Condé? Uh, almost three years. Almost three years. And, and where were you before? I'm curious. You mentioned your other life now. Uh, oh, I was, I was a data scientist long uh, for many years before um, at uh, CCC. Uh, at NBC Universal, mm -hmm. um, a few startups, but before that I was a particle physicist. Casually. Casually. You were a particle physicist and then you went into TV and now you're a content. <laughs> yeah. If you don't mind me asking, because I think it's fun and I do think we're at, I, I'm not just, I, well, I like telling stories, but I think that we're at an interesting time in technology where if you have a passion or love of something or a curiosity about something, you can actually career pivot and end up in an industry that's really cool. Can you tell me what guided a little bit of those career pivots? Yeah, so I think at the time, um, data science was a newish field where there weren't programs that you could go and study data scientists. I think people were coming from different backgrounds. Um, I learned in my, like, while, while being a scientist, or while working as a physicist, I kind of heard some talks, heard people talk about like how, you know, I was a former astronomer, or I was a former statistician or economist, and yeah. here's what I like did, did uh, in my work, and I found out how to apply that to tech and get to see like really fast results. Um, I was influenced, I gotta say, by uh, talk by, someone from Netflix talking about like how they were able to use algorithms to predict what people would watch. And I thought that was a really cool use case of the same math that I was doing in physics to something that was like kind of a fun application. So what's harder, particle physics or predicting what people would watch or read? <laughs> uh, particle physics, we have to be a lot more accurate. Um, so uh, yeah, I would imagine there's a little <laughs> there's a little more ramification if you're slightly off. <laughs> yeah, I mean they just don't accept your results right. if you can't prove <laughs> yeah. them to to. You to can't high just serve accuracy. them Tiger King anyway. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> 
<laughs> oh, that's but great. in some ways, you know, yeah. predicting human behavior is pretty, uh, pretty difficult. I bet it is really difficult. If I'm someone who still reads pulp magazines in the flesh, does that make me old? Do the kids read magazines? We still have print magazines in my house, and you know, um, I there are some kids that still read the the print, but I, I don't. I think it's few and it far. It makes us on your elder end of the yeah, subscriber, yeah. <laughs> the subscriber base. What excites you most? I mean, we're in the middle of this kind of crazy technological revolution. You obviously have a, a robust scientific background. What excites you most about this intersection of, of tooling, science, and potential and velocity with AI revolution? For me, I think what I get really excited about is thinking about how well these models have to understand content mm -hmm. to make these predictions. And that's, that's generally like what I like to exploit. Like, I think a lot about, you know, the applications are fun and, and interesting and they're like engaging, yeah. but the way I, what I think is gonna really like last the test of time is good ways to represent content so that we can start to tailor, to, to create like real personalization or real like um, models that can, that can engage people. Cause when we're sitting here in this attention economy, oh, everybody's everybody's time is so so precious, and we're all fighting for the same minutes. So, well, while I think it's very exciting how we're able to advance within AI and how all the the intersection of all these things coming um, is is like advancing the field so rapidly. I'm more interested in like how we can exploit that for really practical use cases. Well, and I think that's awesome, and, and at least the way that I'm hearing that, something I look forward to is, is even more hyper-customization. Yeah. So rather than waking up to my three different emails, or five different emails, it's probably seven different emails from Condé in the morning, I would wake up to one that was my best bits of each one and be able to toggle out, mm. I would imagine, maybe. That, that is something that we, we, do, we would like to get to, like be able to think about how our network can really enhance engagement. And cross-pollinate, so mm -hmm. you're keeping everyone in the Condé family, yeah. even if they're swapping publications. How long does the average person read an article? It depends on the publication. Um, not that long. <laughs> That's what I thought. So, so I, I studied communication. We that was kind of right when the Jolt economy was coming out, and and the stat when I was a researcher in this was 17 seconds was all you had on okay. a video or within a within a soundbite. So I'm curious if it's similar. I think what we are seeing is a little bit more than that when you think about New Yorker. Maybe a little like around that if you think about some of our other shorter uh, publications. Yeah, that that makes sense. Okay. Do you think we'll read? for longer moving forward? Do you think we'll have more time for reading, maybe because of AI? Now I'm really just going out there. I don't know. What I what we are pretty excited about is audio and how AI can help with um, with creating narrated audio. Yeah. Um, while people are um, maybe not don't have as much time to sit and read or they don't like to read a publication on their phone, people have AirPods in all the time, and so being able to listen to our stories, we found is pretty engaging. So I'm pretty excited about that, um, even if people aren't like reading as much. Well, yes, they're still they're still learning and, and allowed to be curious. And and frankly, with the audio there, it makes it more accessible. Yeah. And and that's that's a big part of it. I, you see, it makes me so happy to see so much more accessibility at all of these shows. And is that something that's a big conversation for you guys? Yeah, we I like to think about that in yeah. different ways that we can make our content accessible to everybody. Yeah, and it makes it more more fun and interesting. And you're basically turning the articles into a podcast almost exactly. automatically. I mean, a, I yeah. can essentially already do that. So, wow, that's really cool. What's the future for Conde? What's the future for you? Uh, future for Conde, I think we are thinking a lot more about how we can leverage all this technology to enhance um, our offerings and make make uh, make our content more accessible and more um, easier to to uh, discover for for yeah. our customers. Um, for me, I want to keep pushing forward on like bettering our content understanding, expanding beyond text to audio and video and starting to really like come up with good recommendation models. What's the top of the funnel for a brand new reader for you guys? How are you getting them? 
That is a good question. Um, historically, social was was pretty big for us. That's uh, not as as big as it used to be. Right? Search yeah. was another big one. Um, organic growth is really like the most engaged users that we see. People that come. Um, either by referral or come uh, through. Word of mouth, baby. Yep. It's always <laughs> been the best form of marketing. It always has been. And, and I mean, even with referral engines, nothing beats a good friend telling you, hey, oh my gosh, I read this super cool article. Here, check out my past episode or whatever. Yeah. Check this link. That's great. Wow, Tim. Okay, last question for you, since we're going to definitely have you back on the show. What do you hope to be able to say a year from now that you can't yet say today? Hmm. That uh, we have really explored like what AI can do to enhance our, our offerings. I think that is like we've been toying around. We've been uh, putting on hackathons. We've been getting a lot of cool. good ideas, um, but really like having something in front of our customers that that leverages this while maintaining the integrity of our brands and our journal and our journalism. I love that. Okay, wait, sorry, one more follow-up question because that was an intriguing answer. Let's say I'm someone who's a little nerdy but has always dreamed about working for a publication. I think when people think about GQ or Vogue as examples, or even the New Yorker, you don't always think of high tech as, yeah. as a role within those organizations. What would be your advice to them? Yeah, so I, I also found myself in the same position. I never imagined being able to work in media or in, like in publications. Cool. Like yeah. I was a science nerd. Um, but we live in a place where smart people can get to solve hard pro or know how to solve hard problems, can find the applications that really interest them. And I find like the best data scientists are the ones that care a lot about the product that they're offering and they spend time understanding what it is that they're offering. It really helps them drive like the models. It helps them understand um, how to develop and what's going to appeal to the users. So my advice, find the things that you enjoy, find a way to like do data for them because now everybody is trying to exploit data. That was such a good answer, and I love that. It really is the passion that will drive you to ask the questions or of, of the technology or, up or prompt the, the AI or whatever it might be to, to drive down the rabbit hole and get to the real solutions or get your dream job. Yeah. That was awesome, Tim. Thank you so much, and thanks to the team for always creating excellent content that I enjoy <laughs> reading in my free time. And thank all of you for taking your free time to tune in to theCUBE. We're here at Databricks, the data and AI event. My name's Savannah Peterson from San Francisco. You're watching theCUBE, the leading source for enterprise tech news.